You wanna know the only thing that's more difficult than trying to find the right cinema camera for you? It's trying to find what lens goes with that camera. Nowadays, with the accessibility of cinema cameras, the topic of whether or not to get a cinema lens or a set of cinema lenses is becoming a little bit more frequent. And to be honest, there's actually nothing wrong with getting a hybrid or a stills photography lens. I mean, this is the Sigma 35 millimeter DGDN and it does take photos and it does a really good job of doing video, but what would drive someone to buy something like the Sigma high speed prime lens? So in today's video, we're gonna talk about what makes a cinema lens a cinema lens and whether or not it's worth it for you to actually buy one instead of one of these guys. Now, first things first, you're gonna notice that these two lenses look drastically different from each other. And the housing for a lot of these cinema lenses, at least the higher quality ones, it's gonna be made out of a metal housing. And that's great because metal is a lot harder to break than these stills and photography lenses that have a combination of obviously metals, but it also has a rubber focus ring as well. And if you've owned any Sigma lens for a long enough time, over time it starts to get a little bit worn or it might change color a little bit. And that's just a sign of use. That's not necessarily saying that the build quality is bad. Now you might be used to the form factor of a photography lens, but if you're not used to cinema lenses, you'll notice that there's these little grooves that actually are on the side of the lens. And these are gear teeth that are made for follow focusing systems. Now, if you're looking for autofocus out of something like the High Speed Prime by Sigma, you're gonna be a little bit disappointed because most cinema lenses, and at the time of this video, all cinema lenses don't have autofocus. In fact, a lot of fully manual lenses don't have the contact points to actually transmit information into your camera. However, the Sigma 35 millimeter High Speed Prime does actually have that sitting inside of the lens. So you have these little contact points in here that'll actually tell the focusing distance and your aperture that'll transmit on your screen. This actually really comes in handy. On the side of your lens, you're obviously going to have markings for your distance in terms of your focus. And sometimes I'm not looking at it while I'm solo operating because I honestly couldn't be bothered to look down at the side of my camera sometimes. I'm, I'm busy, I'm doing stuff. So when I am trying to judge the distance in terms of my manual focus, when it shows up on the screen, it makes my life that much easier. Now, speaking of aperture, there is a manual aperture ring as well, which is nice because if you are using hard stop ND filters or no filter at all, you could actually turn this to adjust your filter on the fly. And it is a D-click aperture. So it is a smooth rotation, which means that you could change your exposure on the fly without seeing the hard stops between when you're changing from one aperture to the other. Now on the plus side, the new Sigma 35 also has a manual aperture as well that you can click or you can de-click to either make sure you don't get stuck or if you want that smooth graduation that you get from the cinema version. You will have a couple of custom buttons on the lens as well for different features. Most of the time I use it to lock in my autofocus, which you could turn on and off on the lens itself. Now sure, a cinema lens doesn't have the luxury of having autofocus and you're gonna have to use manual focus most of the time. However, you are gonna get something called a long focus throw. And basically what that means is that the distance between your infinity focus and when you're gonna get to your minimum focus is a lot longer of the rotation on the ring than it is on a hybrid or a stills lens. Now, if you're looking at any lenses, one of the first thing you're gonna look at after the focal length is gonna be its aperture, or you might be used to this and it's called an F-stop. On cinema lenses, you're gonna get something called a T-stop, which is gonna be a little bit different and might raise a couple of questions. Now, an F-stop is gonna be an approximation in terms of the light transmission from the front of your lens into your camera. So what might end up happening is that even though you're shooting at f1.4, if you're using different lenses and different cameras, you actually might get slightly different exposures. But on the flip side, T-stops are actually an exact representation of how much light is being transmitted into your camera, which makes it a lot easier, especially in multicam situations or when you're using different lenses amongst a set to make sure that you're getting the right exposure every single time. Now we might be going back to the look and build of these two lenses, but there's something important you need to understand. Now when I take off the lens cap on both of these lenses, you're gonna notice that the elements actually are kind of the same size, which might be a little bit confusing because this guy's filter thread is 95 millimeters and this guy is only 67. Now, generally speaking, cinema lenses are made and designed with video production in mind. And most of the time, you're gonna see cinema lenses get released in sets of either two, three, four, or even more lenses at any given time. So oftentimes, you're gonna have to switch the rig and how your camera is set up. And something like being on a gimbal or the map box that you're using, you're gonna need a consistent focal length and a consistent weight in order for you to make those transitions seamlessly. Now, most cinema lens sets do have very consistent filter threads to them. And if you're using something like a map box, usually it defaults to something like a 95 millimeter, so no matter what lens you're using, at least in the Sigma Cine set, you're going to have a consistent thread that you can put things on and you don't have to worry about getting step up rings or different adapter rings in order to go on the front of your class. Stills lenses are a little bit different. Even across something like my 35 millimeter G Master or even my 50 millimeter, you're gonna have different filter threads. And a lot of the times with these guys, when I wanna get this on a map box or something, I have to use different step up rings in order to do that, especially using something like the Tilt to Mirage. It is a little bit different and I feel like stills lenses aren't necessarily designed for you to buy the entire set and have that consistency, but at the same time, this is going to be a lot lighter than using something like this guy. 
In fact, the Sigma 35 millimeter DGDN actually weighs a lot less than its cinema line counterpart. Now there are a couple of differences between cine lenses and stills lenses, but you're probably in it to also see some test footage. So we're gonna roll some of that footage and talk about one of the most important and maybe off-putting parts of owning one of these two lenses. After looking at some of this footage, one of the biggest things about cinema lenses versus still photography lenses is gonna be the C word, character. And character is kind of difficult to explain because you can't really put it on a spec sheet. You can't really measure a character of a lens in terms of its aperture or its thread size or its focal length. It's just the look of what the lens renders in combination with your camera. So you're gonna get a bunch of different looks that filmmakers and cinematographers gravitate to. And those are more unique onto the cinema lens side of things versus the stills photography lenses. I find with cinema lenses across different lines from the Sigma lenses or the other brands that I've used, they have a certain identification and they're trying to make a certain statement, have a certain look, a certain identity to them when I am using them with my camera. And one reason why you might want to pick a cinema lens is to portray that in some of the work that you have. Steels and photography lenses are great, but for the most part, they're very sharp and they're very clinically clean, which is hard of a term to describe, but basically it just looks very neutral and it's meant to be very sharp, which is a lot of the reason why people get things for photography. They want sharper lenses and they can adjust things in Lightroom and in post. But with cinema lenses, you're trying to really say something with the look that you're producing. And that's why we're gonna go into this last thing, which might set you off a little bit, and that's gonna be price. All right, so editor Kofi here, and I accidentally got the prices wrong between these two lenses. But if you wanna pick up the Sigma DGDN, you only really have to pay about eight or $900 US in order to get one, which is still a lot of money, but in the grand scheme of things, it's actually pretty affordable. And I hope you're seated. I hope you're comfortable because if you want to pick up the cinema counterpart, it's it's going to cost you about $3,500 US, which is almost about five times as much, which might actually introduce a question of why would someone be crazy enough to spend $3,500 with something with similar optical quality? Because at the end of the day, in full disclosure, the 35 millimeter cine lens has the same glass as the 35 millimeter photography version, the version before the one that's that's come out recently and why I would still probably do it. Uh, don't get me wrong, the standard price for cinema lenses aren't nearly that high. There's a bunch of other companies that offer more affordable cinema glass, but one of the things for me is going to be longevity in a set and creating a set of lenses that I want to portray my style of work. And I do like the look that comes out of the Sigma lenses. It has a nice roll off, at least in the cine version. It's still pretty decently sharp and it is a little bit more on the neutral side, but I could also add things like filter and I could grade it the way that I want it to. And it's more malleable and at least in my eyes, so I can make the image what I want it to, whether I want a more vintagey, warmer look, there's actually classic lenses for that, or I want to go with the cleaner look that I I usually do for a lot of my fitness commercials. The big things about this lens are not only some of the characters, but it's also things that I want to last for a long time. And in my eyes, if I wanna buy a four lens kit that I'm gonna use for the majority of my projects, I don't really have a big problem with spending a lot of money on lenses because I might never spend that money ever again. Basically what I'm trying to say is that if you have the money to buy cinema lenses, take a look at not only the optical quality, but also keep in mind, are you gonna actually keep these lenses for the long haul? And does it produce a look that you can work with and you could grow into? And also you could customize if your filmmaking actually changes. And to be honest, that's probably the reason why I might look a little bit deeper into this set because Sigma didn't give me these to keep. I'm, I'm just borrowing it for a while. However, I do like them and I might use them a lot more in a lot more projects. That being said, if you guys do like the video, I hope you guys enjoyed it or at the very least you learned a couple things about the differences between stills lenses and cinema lenses. Uh, leave a comment down below. You guys are probably stills photography lens users, but if you do have reasons as to why you're looking at cinema lenses, leave them down below and we'll, uh, I don't know, we'll talk about it or something like that. That being said, if you want to see another video, it's probably somewhere on this side of the screen and uh, I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.